Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being in your place. And I uh, trust you had a good afternoon today, had some rest and refreshment, and looking forward to being back in God's house and learning from the Bible one more time tonight. Welcome all those watching on the live stream, being with us as well. Maybe you're part of our church, you're here in the Phoenix area, maybe you're in a different part of our country and you've already had your evening gatherings and services for tonight, but you uh, wanted to tune in and be with us. And so thank you for coming and uh, thankful for what God has done already today. We had great services this morning. And appreciate the wonderful spirit and the great, great crowd. Enjoy seeing visitors here. And uh, we've uh, to highlight, try to highlight the, the ways people come to our church. Sometimes it's because of our website. Sometimes it's because of uh, an invitation, a personal invitation, or somebody got an invitation at their door. Uh, we had a family come this morning who saw our uh, sign that we put out right on the streets. And so, you know, especially on days like today when it's so windy and you're battling the elements, sometimes I think we ran into that problem with the Easter sign that we had sticking in the ground wind and rain and everything trampled it and or the kids trampled it walking across from the school. I don't know what something happened, but uh, uh, but this uh, family lives in the apartment complexes right across the way and said uh, we wanted to come check out your church and just enjoy the service. A sweet, sweet family. And so we're praying they come back. And uh, so you never know as you're faithful to invite people or faithful to do your job and put out the signs, whatever the case is, uh, God has different ways of bringing people in. So we're thankful for that and thankful that he brought you in tonight. You might have blown you in. It's still pretty windy out there, uh, but glad that I don't see any uh, Mary Poppins with umbrellas or anything coming in. So you, you found your way in uh, and we're thankful for that. I hope that you got a chance to look down through the bulletin. We mentioned a couple announcements this morning in regarding the VBS coming up and the uh, family game night. We had a, already a great uh, start to the sign-up sheet for that. Uh, my comments about being competitive and not letting me lose, uh, glad that did not deter anybody away. If anything, it made people sign up because now you want to see me lose. And so I just say to you in, the, in a kind and gracious spirit, bring it on. That's what I say. So family game night, April 26. We're going to have a great time. And we'll make that announcement one more time next week, try to get a few more to sign up. But that if you need directions or you need the address to my house, let me know. Uh, and then you'll look down at the bottom of the bulletin. You'll see coming up in the month of May, it seems like we have something going on just about every Sunday, which are exciting days. Our next opportunity for outreach is that first Saturday, Saturation Saturday, May the 4th. And then we get to have a baby dedication service again that next day, May the 5th, the first Sunday of the, the month. And so always a special time for our church and we get to uh, have that opportunity again. And then that evening, you'll note that this that will be the final night for our breakout classes, the final night for master clubs, the final night for our adult class. Uh, so really it's coming down to the wire just about three weeks uh, after tonight, just three more gatherings. And then we'll get to be uh, together in there across the way uh, throughout the summer. Uh, and then, of course, we have a Mother's Day. Uh, and notice I put that in there so we can go ahead and start planning what we want to do, gentlemen, for the special women in, uh, in our lives and their, their, or honor them on that day. And then uh, May the 19th, we're going to have kind of the, the, uh, the, the wrap up for this year for Master Clubs. That's our awards night and uh, kind of thinking through some special things we can do that we'll try to give you some more details on. It's just going to be a fun night as we get ready to head into the summer uh, and look forward to a wonderful summer season together. But let me uh, update us, if I can, on a couple of things by way of prayer request uh, as we maybe uh, give a few more minutes for some folks coming in, uh, in in case they are able to be blown in and join us as well from outside. But we mentioned on Thursday night, and we want to mention again, be in prayer for Ms. Judy Hainel uh, as she is going in on Tuesday for an MRI uh, to check out the damage, uh, just how extensive uh, what, what all has taken place with that torn rotator cuff. She will need surgery uh, to see what kind of surgery, how uh, deep of a surgery they need to go in. So pray for that MRI on Tuesday, if you will. And then also pray for Mrs. Goldie Owens. Uh, Ms. Goldie is having a cataract surgery. She's really some in both eyes. Her first one is this week, uh, Saturday, I do believe the 23rd. So, or uh, that's not the Saturday. That's not the it's not the 23rd. I believe it's this Saturday that that is coming up. So we're coming up very shortly, uh, the 20th. I think that's what that date is. And so be in prayer for her and that upcoming procedure. Uh, and then uh, we'll keep you posted on how those things turn out and what we can do to be a help in the days to come. Well, let's open up in a word of prayer tonight. And we'll ask God to help us, uh, give us understanding of his word, and, uh, and bless our time and bless the kids and the youth across the way there. Our Father, we're sure are grateful for the opportunity to be back in church tonight. Thank you for the great day that you gave us already this morning. Thank you for the returning guests and the new guests that you brought our way. And thank you for the Bible and how it is so instructive and helpful and just meets us right where we are. Uh, and Lord, I ask that you would bless our time tonight. 
I, bless, I pray and I'm thankful for each and every adult who is here, every parent that's brought children, every grandparent that's brought kids, and uh, every adult that is here as well, wanting to learn your word and uh, support our church and just be a part of our church family. Thank you for them, and I ask that this time will be profitable for us tonight. And I ask the same for the youth programs in the room behind us, our master clubs. Thank you for the great year that you've given us, for the decisions that have been made, for the principles that have been instilled, the verses that have been learned, for, for the potential that is in that room behind us. Lord, thank you for allowing us to have us just a small part in, uh, uh, in, in directing and guiding them and, and investing in them at a young age. And I pray these last four or three or four weeks would be a, a fun time, a memorable time, but a, a, a sharpening and a molding time to uh, to be uh, uh, the young men and the young ladies that you would have them to be. Lord, I ask that you bless our workers tonight, that you bless them and use them in a great way, and I ask that you help us as we get ready to open up the Bible together. Uh, use this time to be a help to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to be in the book of Luke tonight. If you'd like to turn there, Luke chapter number 18. Luke chapter number 18. And uh, as you're turning there, we're going to make some uh, room for folks as it looks like the, there's we have a few more that are making their way in. And so we've got a couple of seats here. Uh, you did a one, you knew they were coming in. And so everybody picked the back row, the back table tonight, and you left the front. Appreciate the Vessies holding down the front table <laughs> in their place. Do we need to relocate? No, you are fine. You do not need to relocate. Y'all are awesome. So thank y'all for being here and uh, appreciate our folks who are coming in just a moment as well. Luke chapter number 18, we are continuing on in our study, our series on Sunday nights that we have entitled uh, Ears to Hear, as we are studying the parables that Jesus gave. He gave parables and then he said, he that has ears to hear, uh, let him hear. And we learned a few weeks ago, the very first lesson, the reason why Jesus gave parables. Hey, good evening, everybody. The reason why Jesus gave uh, instruction and teaching in this manner is because he, uh, there were some who were willing to receive truth and wanted to hear the truth, and there were others who willingly rejected the truth. And so uh, Jesus said, for the people who have ears to hear, I'm going to give truth in this manner, and that's the kind of people we want to be, isn't it? We want to have ears to hear hearts to understand, and then, of course, hands and feet to go out and apply the truths that we're learning. So we're in Luke chapter number 18 tonight as we get going. Tonight, we're going to examine the parable of the praying men. The parable of the praying men. Now, I do not know if that is the official title of this parable. Uh, uh, maybe your heading has a, your, a heading in your Bible has a different title. But, uh, the official title is like the parable of the sower or the wheat and the tares or the lost coin. I'm not sure this one has an official title. Uh, it's just the way by which I remember it. But then again, uh, 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 those are just titles that are you know, uh, uh, man-given and man-made. But that's the way we're going to remember it tonight, the uh, parable of the praying men. As you can probably surmise, it is about two men who prayed. You know, one prayed for themselves, and the other prayed about themselves. But this parable really is not about the topic of prayer. So if you were with us this morning, you can go ahead and do one of these. Whoo, you know, do a sigh of relief because this morning's message was on our prayer life, really praying for others from Colossians chapter 1. And we said anytime we hear a biblical message on prayer, you know, for most, if not all of us, it, it provokes some sort of conviction of uh, the way we pray or the time we spent in prayer. We had people walking out this morning who said, Pastor, I just don't pray enough. And my response was, you know, I think I'm right there with you. These are all disciplines in which we are still growing and developing and wanting to do better. So the sigh of relief comes from not having two convicting messages necessarily on prayer back to back. We don't have to walk out of both services feeling like, man, I'm just not doing a good job. So this is hopefully being an encouraging lesson for you tonight. If it's not about prayer, then why does it involve two praying men? Well, the answer lies not so much in what they prayed, but in why they prayed. In what they prayed, but why they prayed. And then the answer will also lie in what happened after they prayed. We're in Luke chapter 18. Let's read the parable together. We're going to work our way through it, and then I think you'll see what we mean. Luke chapter 18, we're going to begin reading in verse number 9, and we'll read the entirety of the parable right now. It's just down to verse number 14. 
And so I invite you to follow along with me in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse number 9, where the Bible says that Jesus, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men, here's the parable, verse number 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican, a tax collector. The Pharisee, verse 11, stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Verse number 12, he said, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Luke chapter 18, verse number 13 says this, The publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but instead smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man, The publican, the second guy who prayed, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Well, this is not a parable about prayer, then what is it about? Well, the theme is found in the key verse, which is verse number 14, and it's found in this word. It's the word justified. You see that word in verse number 14? Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified, and this other man did not. This is a parable about what we call the the doctrine of justification, or in other terminology, this is a parable about salvation. Now, in this series so far, we have Uh, We are connecting the dots Jesus makes as He presents truth about His kingdom. He is speaking in parables, but He is giving truths about the kingdom of God. And this particular parable, though it may seem simple to us, and truthfully, the doctrine of salvation is simple, isn't it? So simple that even a child, a childlike faith can grasp it. In the day in which Jesus spoke these words, His audience uh, they, they, they would have been amazed. The, uh, these words would have been the opposite of everything his culture and his audience were conditioned to believe were true. They were radical words. That's the words I'm looking for. Uh, how radical these words would have been, and yet how necessary they were to be preached. I say how necessary they are to still be preached in our day today. And one writer about this passage put it this way, every detail in the doctrine of justification is set forth, it's illustrated, or it's otherwise affirmed in this parable. Okay, so before we dive in, let's just make sure we're all on the same page tonight. When we talk about justification or someone being justified, here is what that means. The Bible word, it it speaks of one who has been declared righteous by God. It speaks of one who has been declared righteous by God. It's taking us back to that courtroom scene where God is the judge, and in His holiness, He pounds His gavel on the desk, and He declares that sin has been dealt with. That's very important. God cannot overlook sin. He doesn't look the other way. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. uh, Sin has a price that must be paid. And he declares that sin has been dealt with and the sinner is justified. They are declared righteous. They are no longer under sin's penalty. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing for somebody to know, isn't it? That is the very heart and center of the gospel message. And so this parable of the praying men, in essence, it is a parable about what exactly is the true gospel message. What is the true gospel? How can a person be justified, declared righteous in the eyes of God? I say to us tonight in this room and to those listening and watching now and maybe even at a later date, you click on this message and you listen to it. How can a person be justified? What do we need to believe? What does the Bible say to be included in God's kingdom? 
What message do we need to proclaim so others can have their residence in His kingdom as well? And then what message is deceiving so many into thinking they are justified? They are righteous in God's eyes. And unless somebody tells them the truth, unless their eyes are opened, they are in line for a rude awakening one day when they stand before the Lord. So let's examine this parable more closely, and hopefully those questions will be answered tonight. Would you notice, first of all, the purpose for this parable? The purpose for this parable. I just think it always helps to set the scene for who and why Jesus gives his parables. Because remember, parables were earthly stories that had a spiritual or a heavenly meaning. There was a spiritual principle Jesus wanted to relay. There was a reason why he chose to use this particular story with these particular characters. So somebody, multiple people, needed to hear what he was about to say. So we got to ask, who are these people? Well, Luke is clear from the get-go about his target audience in verse number 9. Look at what he says again in verse 9. It says, Jesus spoke this parable unto certain certain individuals who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They believed they were righteous in and of themselves. Now what's interesting is what Luke records Jesus saying right before this instance, this parable in verses 1 through 8. And what do you know? It's another parable. And guess what? It's also about prayer. I mean, Luke 18, it was just the, the, the prayer parables, I guess is what it is. But in the first part of this chapter, it is a parable about a woman who is persistent in her prayer. Jesus says she has such a need and she knows that only a judge can help her. And so in the story, she goes to the judge again and again and again until eventually seeing this woman's persistence, the judge agrees to help her. Her. The judge agrees to right the wrong that has been done against her, and he meets her need. Now, we're going to save what that need was, what that hurt was, the wrong was. We're going to save why that judge was the only one who could help her for another lesson at another date. But what I want you to notice, to tie it into this lesson, is look, look at what Jesus said was the moral of that parable at the end of verse number 8. Okay, so our text, we started reading in verse 9. I want you to look at the tail end of verse number 8. That helps us understand what Jesus said uh, in our time tonight, our story tonight. In verse number 8, look at the middle of the verse where it says, Nevertheless, you see that? The tail end of the verse. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Shall he find faith on the on the earth. This parable is about a, this particular woman's faith, okay? It's her faith in the judge to make her wrongs right. Now we're going to explain that parable at a later lesson at a later date. But the point is the judge, there is faith that the judge will take care of those who have wronged her. There's faith that he is going to right the wrongs. That's what her faith was about in that parable. And now right behind that, Jesus addresses another group of, uh, in the audience uh, and see again what the Bible says about their condition. So right after he tells this whole parable about the faith and the persistent faith in the judge to make wrongs right, verse 9, Jesus now turns his attention to certain individuals, apparently who were there and listening, the Bible says that trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So right after hearing about how the judge will handle people who have wronged others, there's faith that one day the wrongs will be made right. There's a group of people that within themselves say, you know what, I'm good. I won't be in that position one day because I haven't wronged the judge. I haven't wronged anybody. Nobody will be able to point the finger at me. I don't have wrongs that need to be righted. I am righteous. The Bible says there were certain individuals there. We don't know necessarily who the group was or how many were there. If you would back up and read the prior context in the previous chapter, it, it indicates this is a section of Jesus speaking where Pharisees are present. And no doubt, I believe they are here as well. 
But the specific names of the audience are not as important as much as we need to identify the specific nature of his audience. Because they not only viewed themselves as righteous, the Bible says they then elevated themselves above those around them. In fact, look at the last two verses, excuse me, the last two words of verse number nine. The last two words. It said, after they, they trusted in themselves, they were righteous. And it says this, they despised others. Not only did they trust in themselves, we're good. We won't be guilty before the judge. They took that attitude and they used it to view others in a certain way. They despised others. And I tell you, that word is only used one other time in the Gospels. And then I want you to look at a couple of uh, examples of how it's used in the, the rest of the New Testament to get the idea of this word and just how serious a problem this is and why Jesus addresses it. So in Luke chapter 18, would you turn over to chapter 23, please? Luke chapter 23, just a couple of pages over to your right, if you would. Luke chapter 23, this is the account of when Jesus has been arrested. Uh, he's gone through a trial in the middle of the night. And then early in the morning, he stood before Pilate, and Pilate didn't know what to do with him. And so he sent him over to, to Galilee. He heard that Jesus was from Galilee, and Pilate understood, oh, you're actually not in my jurisdiction. There's another guy who, uh, in other words, I, you're not my problem. I don't, have to, you know, I don't have to judge you. I'll send you over to him. Herod is your, in, in, over in Galilee. You come from Galilee. So he sends him to, to Herod. And what does Herod say? Oh, yeah, I've heard about you. You're the miracle boy. Go ahead, Jesus. Perform me a miracle. You know, ever talk to anybody about God and try to explain uh, how do you believe that God is real? And what do they say? Well, I believe God is real. If he strikes me down with lightning right now, go ahead, God, I'm ready. Oh, God didn't strike me down. I guess God's not real. Well, that's the attitude of Herod here. Let me see your miracle, Jesus. I've heard a, about you. And what do you know? Jesus doesn't perform a miracle on the spot. Herod didn't take too kindly to that. And so look at what verse number 11 says of Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, verse 11 says, Herod, with his men of war, set Jesus at naught. And they mocked him, and they arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. Remember, we're, 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 we're looking for the word despise, the attitude that the, the people that, that Jesus spoke to in his parable that they had. Do you see in verse 11 the two words, at naught? They set him at naught. That comes from the same word. It's translated from the same word that we get despised. It talks about being cast to the side. It talks about an attitude that rejects something, that rejects somebody. Same word. We find it in Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, that's the chapter we've come through recently in our study of Romans. It's talking about uh, spirit Christian liberties and how people can have... Um, different views and still get along with each other, not on doctrinal issues, but uh, on, on uh, non-doctrinal issues, preferences and things of that nature. And in Romans 14 and verse number 3, it says, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And so the, 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 uh, the idea, the, the thought, the, the hot-button topic of Paul's day of meat that was eaten and offered, that was offered to idols or, or uh, special ceremonies and rituals. There were some who felt, no, I, I cannot partake of that. And there were others who felt, yeah, I think I do have the liberty. And he told the, those who uh, were, felt they had the liberty to, he said, don't despise, don't reject those who draw the line. Don't reject their influence in your teaching. Again, so the thought here, the word despise, it's an attitude of putting aside, throwing by the way, rejecting. All right, I want you to look at one other phrase, passage with me. Would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We see this idea come up again, and it's interesting what the Apostle Paul says happens when somebody has this attitude. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 27 and following with me, please. Verse 27 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, 
base things of the world, and here it is, things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, things which are not to bring to naught things that are. So the context, he's talking about preaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the previous verses, verse 23, we preach Christ crucified. Uh, the, the preaching of the cross is to uh, them that perish foolishness, but to us who are saved, it's the power of God. He's talking about preaching. What, what is it that God uses to work in people's lives and change lives? What is it that this world looks at as little and base and despised? What do they reject? It's the preaching of the cross. Okay, now see the connection. Look at verse 29. Verse 9, 29, he said this, Why did God use these things? He says that no flesh should glory in His presence. So God elevates the preaching of the cross, the need for sins to be atoned, so that man cannot boast and glory about himself in God's presence. It's kind of what Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 say, isn't it? That salvation is not of works. Why not? Lest any man do what? Boast. Boast. God knows our heart, doesn't He? The, the nature of mankind. Boy, if we could pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, it, we would start to grow a big head. We would start to, to boast about our own self-righteousness. And He says, God's chosen this method. What? Preaching about a, a Savior who came and died a, on a bloody cross so that... It's, he could be the door, so He could be the way. And when that is rejected, and when the need for the cross is rejected, mankind boasts in their own righteousness. Now, I don't need the cross because I am righteous. Boast in the presence of God. That, that kind of sounds like the people to whom Jesus is speaking, isn't it? Back in our text. That kind of sounds like the Pharisee who was praying. They trusted in themselves. They trusted, uh, they considered themselves righteous, and that's causing them to reject, to cast aside, to place themselves above others who they perceive are not as righteous as they are. Even in the presence of God, to them, nope, I'm okay. I'm elevating myself. And so that's the purpose. That's why Jesus gives this parable. But secondly tonight, would you just consider the parable itself with me? The parable itself. And in the time remaining that we have in Luke chapter 18, I just want to highlight the main differences between the two characters that are within this parable. There's the publican, the, the tax collector, and the Pharisee. They were chosen as characters for specific reasons. And I believe because they represent the most polar, extreme opposites of the day in which Jesus lived. The highest of the good people, good people, and the lowest of the bad people. So let me point out four differences, and then we'll be through tonight. Uh, here are their differences. Would you note their prestige? Would you note their prestige or the stigma that was about them? Well, the Pharisee, he was a, a social and a religious insider. I mean, he was the elite of the elite. He occupied the top rung on the societal pecking ladder. Well, if you had a Pharisee come to eat lunch with you, you were doing something right. I mean, you, well, all the press would have been there. They would have rolled out the red carpet. It was a mark of high status. Pharisees had the best seats at the table. They sat on the platform, if you would, in the synagogue, elevated above the people, so the people could see them, of course. They were very zealous in their religion, but we know it to be an extreme measure of zeal, enforcing the law, enforcing things that weren't even in the law, imposing a guilt upon others who did not measure up to their standards. So to put it this way, they put themselves at the top of the ladder next to God, of course, but nobody else. They put themselves at the top of the ladder, and everybody who wasn't as spiritual or as good as them was underneath them. Now would you travel with me all the way down to the bottom of that same societal ladder, and who do you find? The lowest of the lowest, the most universally despised people in all of Israel, the IRS, I mean the tax collectors, <laughs> the publicans. I mean... You talk about a stigma. Tax collectors had it. What an apropos lesson with tomorrow being tax day, huh? 
So, so pay your taxes, right? So if you weren't bitter coming in, you're going to be bitter at the IRS now because of this lesson. Tax collectors had a stigma. They were grouped on that lower rung also with harlots and with drunkards in that day. I mean, in other places in the Gospels, again, talking to the Pharisees, Jesus said this. He said, publicans and harlots would enter into his kingdom before the Pharisees did. And he said it to make a point. I mean, I get the feeling Jesus did not did not really like the Pharisees very much. They didn't like what they stood. They didn't like their their uh, their self righteousness, did he? Well, because of their stigma, because of the tax collector stigma, you did not want to associate with them. That's why the Pharisees were amazed that Jesus would eat lunch with them. This guy eats with publicans. He eats with other sinners. How can he be a holy man sent from God? Because those people are anything but holy. Yeah, when you pay your taxes, you'll say the same thing, won't you? Yeah. Well, outside of nobody liking to pay taxes, why were publicans so despised? Well, it all had to do with their allegiance and their unethical business practices. Tax collectors in this day, they were Jews who worked for the Roman occupiers in their territory. They were turncoats, traitors to their countrymen, if you will. And so based on the census of the area, there was a certain level of taxes the Romans expected them to bring in. But only the Romans, their government, and only the tax collectors, they were the only ones privy as to what that number, that assessment was. They, you know, there weren't slips in the mail going out from Maricopa County like today, from the county assessor's office telling you about the value and the taxes of your land and such. No, no, no. The tax collectors, they would agree to be responsible. Yep, we're responsible for this much and we'll turn it into you. But what they would do, they would just set a higher tax amount for their jurisdiction. People didn't necessarily know about it, but they did. And they would just, whatever money came in, they would pocket the extra, give to the Romans what they had required, and they'd take the extra for themselves. Couldn't do anything to stop it. They were siding with the hated Romans, and they were exploiting their own people for their personable gain. There's anybody who was a sinner that deserved the worst kind of punishment. It was the it was the tax collectors. It was these guys. All right? That was their stigma. The highest of the highest and the lowest of the lowest. Their prestige. But then would you note their posture as well? The differences in their posture. We read that both men are praying while standing. And that's certainly nothing strange or different. Uh, That's just different from our culture, how we pray in our Western civilizations and culture. But when we pray, what do we say? We say heads bowed and eyes closed and, you know, hands folded. But in the ancient Middle East, they would pray standing up. And they would pray not with their hands folded, but with their hands lifted, elevated like this. And not just their hands lifted, they'd lift their heads. They wouldn't bow their heads, they'd lift them. They were praying to God, and they wanted their eyes open and, and even speaking audibly. And so their method of prayer was not this, it was, it was this. And so it's not so much the fact that the Pharisee is praying with this posture. All indication is that's what he did. But what stands out about this is what we know of where he was praying. Because Jesus mentioned the prayer of the Pharisees in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5, he said that they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. So where was he on the temple grounds? We don't necessarily know in the parable, but the indication and the implication is it was somewhere up front where everybody could see him and where everybody could hear him. Right in the middle of it all, right there. I read one author this week who believed this particular one in the parable, he positioned himself as close in that inner court to the holy of holies as he could get. Now, only the high priest could go in there, and we understand that, but he said he believed this guy was as close on the outside as he could get, right up front, right as close to God's presence as he could be, because in his mind, he said he belonged there. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but what we do know is the contrast between verses 11 and verses 13. Because verse 13 doesn't tell us that the publican was standing right up in front and center around everybody. The Bible emphasizes where he was, or where he was not, I should say. Verse 13, it says that he was standing afar off. He wasn't as close to God as he could get. He wasn't as close to other worshipers as he could get. He prays afar off. The indication is... I don't deserve to be in this place. 
I don't deserve to come approach you. I don't deserve to be around these other worshipers. The Pharisee lifted his hands and his eyes and his voice for everybody to hear. The, the tax collector doesn't even bother lifting his head, does he? He bows his head. He's overwhelmed with guilt. He's overwhelmed with his sin. He feels unworthy to even look up at God. The contrast in these individuals, you've got this Pharisee Lord, praying out loud for everybody, Lord, I thank you that I'm better than this guy and this guy. Lord, thank you. I've done this and here's my resume. And then you've got this guy just in the back corner. Doesn't care who sees him. Doesn't care if nobody knows that he slipped into church on the, on the, on the service. He just, he's overwhelmed and just says, beats his chest, which was a, another sign of mourning. Beats his chest and says, Lord, be merciful to me. The posture is different, but then, of course, would you note their prayer as well, the differences in their prayer. Because Jesus made the interesting statement in verse 11 about the Pharisee. Verse 11, he said he prayed with himself. He prayed with himself. It's loud. It's audible enough for everybody to hear it, but the idea is he's, he's also praying to himself and for himself. Patting himself on the back, stroking his ego. In a span of two verses, verse 11 and 12, he talks about himself five separate times. He uses that personal pronoun, I. And five times he reminds God of all the good things he's done. God, I don't cheat people. I don't cheat on my spouse. I'm not unjust I, I, I tithe, I do what the law tells me to do. I fast twice in the week, which was above and beyond what was commanded. I do more than other people do, as if a perfect, sinless God would be impressed with this man's resume. And yes, he says thanks. He thanks God, but only because he's better than other people. I thank you, God, that I'm not like him. You know, he doesn't actually praise God. Thank you, God, for what you've done. God, I thank you that I am this. He doesn't actually praise God. He doesn't make petitions to God. See, don't, don't miss this, please. The Pharisee asks nothing from God in this prayer, does he? He asks nothing. No mercy, no forgiveness, no grace, no help whatsoever. And that's the point. He asks for nothing because he feels he needs nothing. He asks for nothing because he thinks he needs nothing. To whereas the tax collector's prayer, it's short, but it's earnest. It's a genuine plea to God for help. He admits his need. I am a sinner. I'm not worthy to be here before you. And what he, he admits what he deserves because of his sin. No, he asks for mercy which indicates to us he recognized his sin deserved a punishment. And that's what mercy is. God, don't give me the punishment I deserve. He's not presenting a resume to God. He did not offer to do anything for God. Instead, he was looking for God to do what he could not do for himself. That's a big difference in the two, isn't it? God, I'm in trouble. And if I get that trouble, then I deserve it. I deserve that trouble, but God, would you be kind enough to give me mercy? That was their prayer. Then the last difference I want you to note is their position. Their position. Because we said the key verse in the whole parable is verse number 14. And whatever kind of crowd Jesus was talking to, however many Pharisees that were there, Jesus no doubt drew some loud gasps of amazement, mouths maybe dropped open when he said, and this man, not the Pharisee, the tax collector. This man went to his house justified. And not just justified, justified rather than the other. This man, the lowest of the low, he was justified. And this man, the highest of the high, was not. The way the grammar in that verse is constructed, it tells us the man had been justified and he would continue being justified. It's an act in the past that carries its action through the present and the future. In other words, once he was justified, he forever 
would be justified. He was forever righteous. And this one moment, this one very instant, that day, that hour, the most extreme sinner was pronounced righteous without performing any work, without following any ritual, without earning any merit. And so I submit to us tonight, that only happens one of two ways. Either the judge overlooks sin and acts as if it never happened, or he deals with the sin and the penalty has been paid. And I remind us that God is a righteous judge. He never overlooks sin. That's where Jesus comes in. Thanks to Jesus and His death on the cross, the payment for our sin has been paid. And so Romans 3 and verse 26 puts it this way. God, because He punished Jesus on the cross for the payment of our sin, God is just that He might be just and the justifier of them which believeth in Jesus. He's just because He deals with sin. And He's the justifier. He's the one who declares people righteous. I say, what a radical parable this would have been. And what a reality check to those in the audience who declared themselves to be righteous. The point of the parable, Jesus said, no, you need to be declared righteous by the heavenly judge. Or one day, that judge will reject you. Well, I'm thankful for the day the Lord opened my eyes to the true gospel. And I hope you have that testimony as well. I'm thankful for our church. And I want us to always, I want to always be a part of a church that preaches the truth. Because this truth is too important to get wrong. And thank God for the parable of the man who cried for mercy and God heard him. Because that man was us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer tonight. Lord, thank you for the simple truth and yet a, a wonderful reminder of why we do what we do and the message that we proclaim, why we set up and tear down every week, why we invite people, why we pray for you to work. It's because this world is still full of people who might be just like that Pharisee, maybe, or maybe not re as religious. Maybe they wander into a church. Maybe they've been raised in church and yet they think, that their good can outweigh their bad. They think themselves to be righteous. And that's just not what your word says. Lord, we know that in the parables that Jesus gave, they were not factual. They were not based on real people. But of all the parables, this might be the one where it's closest to having real people because we see it so often in our world still today. Lord, thank you for the day you opened our eyes and help us to never lose sight of that. The reason we serve you, the reason we walk with you, the reason we uh, want to grow in our faith is because of what you did for us. Lord, help us to be steadfast and faithful in getting that message out. And thank you for our church. Thank you for those who labor each and every week so we can have a church here uh, that preaches the truth. Help us to be faithful in that endeavor. Thank you that you are just and that you are also the justifier of all who believe in Jesus. I pray you'd help us. Give us opportunities to share that message with somebody this week and help us to make the most of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, I'm thankful we serve a God who gives mercy, aren't you? And that opportunity is still available uh, for each and every day. The goodness of God leads people to repentance. And so thank you for being in your place this morning and once again tonight. And if we can do anything for you, let us know. We're glad to serve you in some way this week. But just about three weeks left. Remember, May the 5th. Uh, is our final uh, master clubs and uh, adult class away. So night, so coming down to the wire here, just three weeks left. But thank you for being faithful, and I hope you are continue to be faithful. Walk with the Lord this week, and Lord willing, we'll see you back on Thursday night for our prayer and Bible study. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.